uh, I'm an astrophysicist and I like to get high. <laughs> if you got me wrong, as an astrophysicist, astronomer, we like to get high, for example, high in the mountains with our telescopes. You can see younger version of me at the two best telescopes in Hawaii and Chile, not only observing the stars, but also inventing the devil before it was cool. <laughs> but then if that's not high enough, you know, you always want to get higher, then you actually build telescopes in space. So this one is the Keops telescope built by the University of Bern, which some of you might have heard about, and then over there the James Webb Space Telescope which again, some of you might have watched the lounge around Christmas and all the great images coming in recently. I'm also here because I'm so nice looking and also good scale of all the example of the two telescopes. So here you can see, um, again, very masked before it was cool, in the clean room, <laughs> in the clean room, uh, in the clean room at the University of Bern, this tiny 30 centimeter, relatively small mirror in the back, and then over there, Six and a half meter gold coated pavilion would already be a pretty decent sized telescope on the ground, but really like the biggest thing we've ever sent in space, the James Webb Space Telescope. So then the question is why are we getting high, right? And the answer is this little tiny atmosphere on top of our planet. So this really tiny layer. Because if you're a photon, you know, a light particle coming from millions of light years away, it's most of the time it's a very decent, nice cruise, you know, autobahn, and then the last, you know, 100 kilometers, you get bumping into all these, you know, air molecules, you get reflected, um, disturbed, scattered, and whatnot. So this is really the problem, this atmosphere that is disturbing the light and it's coming in. And that's different depending on what, what wavelengths, what color of light you're looking at. So we all know our eyes work in the optical light because optical light actually travels to air. And our phones and radios work in the radio because radio waves go through air. But all the other wavelengths that don't really go through air. So you all know, for example, the UV light gets absorbed in the ozone layer, right? So that means if I'm a UV astronomer interested in the UV light, I need to build the satellite that flies above the ozone layer to even get this UV light. And then you can see there the infrared light right next to the telescope penetrates as deep in the atmosphere in the altitude where planes fly. Right? So this most of the interesting infrared um, light gets absorbed about the altitude where you know you fly to the holidays. So I would say no one is so crazy to put a telescope on a plane, right? Wrong. It's called SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. It works even in German, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And it's really a Boeing 747 completely pimped with a big garage door open in the back. And when I was a student at the University of Cologne, people were building instruments for this, uh, for this telescope, for this flying telescope. My big dream was, you know, maybe. Maybe one of the instruments, maybe put a little screw on one of the pieces that eventually is going to fly to Sophia, maybe somewhere in this garage door that opens and then looks out. And uh, today I'm actually standing here, you know, 20 years later, uh, and I actually flew myself on Sophia. So not just the screw that I put on the instrument, but I myself, you can see me in the cockpit, uh, flew on Sophia for I think six or seven missions by now. This is us flying over Mars. <laughs> Paying attention. This is of course, the, of course, the uh, Grand Canyon. Yeah, this is how it works inside. It's very different from your typical, uh, typical, uh, you know, tourist air, airplane. And again, here, you know, for me to scale again a picture of me that you have uh, an idea that Sophia is roughly the size of a plane, right? <laughs> so if you still think Sophia is not really cool, I want two more things. So first of all, Sophia has a plane car and a rocket. This is how I used to get my 11 year nephew to like Sophia. And then, would you get key credit? Sophia had a cameo in the uh, Okay, all right. So, so now we got that getting high part, right? But what about aliens, right? What, what, what about the aliens 
in the title. So what I mean with aliens or alien worlds is so-called exoplanets. Extra solar planets, planets around our stars. And this is a topic that I'm working on. Uh, right now we know 5,178. I just put this up this morning. So this is the count of exoplanets we know right now. Uh, two Swiss guys actually got a Nobel Prize for uh, finding the first one. And uh, that sounds easy, right? Like 5,000 should be pretty easy to find them. But to illustrate you how hard it is, I brought this video here. So this video shows that this is real data from a NASA uh, satellite. This video shows this tiny little black speck going in front of the sun. So this is the planet Mercury when it passes between us and the sun. So it's transiting between us and the sun. And this shows you how challenging that is for us. We want to find these tiny dark spots next to these giant glowing balls of fire. This is really our challenge. But this video not only illustrates the challenge, this illustrates also one of the methods that we use to find those. Because sometimes we are lucky and not just Mercury transiting between us and the Sun, sometimes we also see other planets transiting in front of other stars. And then if you observe the brightness of the star over time, you see every time, like a heartbeat, when the planet comes back, the brightness of the star goes down. And then again and again you observe this, and this is how we find that there's a planet around the star. And this is what I observed in Sophia. This is what the first observation of this exoplanet transit now on Sophia. Here you can see my team. I'm the guy in the corner, the only one kind of you know, excited. The rest was just not a good for me. Also, uh, three of the people, so the mission director, uh, telescope operator, and instrument scientist were uh, women on this flight. So for the girls in the audience, don't let you they let the boys tell you girls can work for NASA, so this is the, the, this is the proof this mission would have happened without these uh, great women at NASA. And long story short, so this is what we observed. So this is exactly what I showed you. We observed this uh, brightness of this uh, star called HD 1897 something something, and then we observed this dip in the brightness. And this is exactly this, uh, you know, what happened when the planet was close in front of it. And one of the things that we found out, not just with Sophia, with all of these exoplanets that we observed, is that about 10 to 20 percent of the stars in our neighborhood have planets that are similar to Earth in size and temperature and might eventually be good for life, what we call the habitable zone. So next time you get high in the mountains, <laughs> count to five, count to ten, so every tenth to every fifth star in the sky has a planet that is similar to Earth. And with the next generation of telescopes, and the stuff that we are currently developing at ETH, for example, we will be able to tell if these planets that are similar to Earth are really like Earth, or more like a you know, desert, cold desert planet like, like Mars, or this hot, hellish planet like Venus. So we are really the first generation in history that has the technology to answer this you know, millennia old question, are we alone in the universe? But we are also the generation in history that has to take care about this only habitable planet that we know in the universe. Because that's the only one where you can get high. <laughs>